So um, urology and gynecology, I think collectively this may be two and a half percent of the abscite, not terribly high yield, but um, a finite amount of information that hopefully um, this review can be uh, useful to, to go through everything. Sa same as last time, we'll kind of do some rapid fire, then some questions and a little more rapid fire. Um, so we're just gonna start with the urology portion of the review. Um, so Alan, radiologists know anatomy. So uh, from anterior to posterior, what are the structures in the renal hilum? Yeah. Not quite. Yes, and then? Or, or just the collecting system. Yeah, so uh, you can say vein artery pelvis. Here I say vein artery ureter, but the acronym some people use is VAP. Like, uh, so vein artery pelvis. Um, Maria, um, are there any uh, surgical indications for interventions on kidney stones? So say in, that can, we'll call that intractable pain. Yeah. And then can stones make people really sick really fast? Yeah, if, if it's an, a septic stone. Yeah, or if they have a solitary kidney that you're trying to protect. Um, so yeah, but those frequently, it's not like a, um, I guess what this is getting at is going in and stenting and you're done. A staghorn is like, you need to, probably do PCNLs and repeatedly kind of shuck away at that and then do an anti-grade procedure with a wire and then stent over that. And so it's, you can, but I think in terms of like, you see a patient, they have a stone that could otherwise like be given Flomax and go home, but not if they're infected, uncontrollable pain, solitary kidney, uh, loss of renal function, those sorts of things. Um, okay, so, uh, so is there a different, <laughs> We'll start easy. Yes or no? Is there a difference in management of seminomas and non-seminomas germ cell tumors? Yes. yes. Based on the presence of this question, it's an implied yes. What is the difference? It has to do with how you manage the retroperitoneal lymph nodes. Um, anyone? So seminomas are very radiosensitive. So for a seminomas tumor, you typically would do an orchiectomy and retroperitoneal XRT. For non-seminomas tumors, orchiectomy and RPLND, retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, uh, I don't know what kind he had, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if he got an RPLND or not. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, most common site of prostate cancer Mets, just kind of a note or you don't Kevin Anderson specifically bone. Yes. Nailed it. Yes. <laughs> I, I, we're connecting. Yes. Uh, Jamie, number one risk factor for renal cell? Yes. Yes. Uh, is there a genetic syndrome associated with renal cell carcinoma? Uh, Connor. But the presence of this question. Yes. And the follow on question being, what is that? Syndrome? No, it is not called Frank. We're sticking with you. What is, what is the name of that syndrome? It might be associated with uh, uh, CNS tumors and theochromocytomas. Yeah, VHL, von Hippel Lindau. So another source of FEO, that could be how that comes up. Um, most common type of cancer of the bladder, Frank? Yeah, transitional cell or urothelial carcinoma. Um, so how is, a, just broadly speaking, how is testicular torsion treated, Pat? Okay. So you, you are reading at your desk because you have now opened a book and the patient's testicle is, is dying. How do you, how do you do this? Yeah, so, and you generally do bilateral and it's transcrotal. Uh, you don't need to go transinguinal for something like this. Uh, when to terp, this is unlikely to be asked, but patients who have recurrent UTIs, obstruction, renal failure, failure of medical therapy. Uh, and then the most common urinary tract do, uh, issue is a, or abnormality, I should say, is a ureteral duplication. Um, so we'll just jump into some questions. Todd, 25 year old male presents with fullness in his testicle. He has a mass that does not transilluminate on exam and an ultrasound is performed that demonstrates a solid mass. What is the next best step?
correct. Uh, not A, is there another manner in which you could get a tissue diagnosis other than an FNA? It seems like a big step, but you do it for these, these young men presenting with a classic presentation. You don't go transcrotal because you can seed the scrotum. So you, you do a radical orchiectomy through a transignal approach. Yep. Yeah. Do you have any torsion through the female? No. Torsion, you go transcrotal. <laughs> directly to where the testis and gubernaculum are that you're recreating with your orchiopexy. Yeah. Um, so what is, uh, Olivia, best test for a colovesicular, that should be colovesicular, not colovescular fistula. Sorry about that. I'm sorry? <laughs> yes, yes. Next question. Um, I would do a What about, um, so you're you're doing a cysto, but you're insufflating a bunch of fluid in there. Like, is there what's a sensitive radiographic finding for a colovesicular fistula? They don't have a foley. You might look for air in the bladder. That's probably your most sensitive finding. Uh, you're unlikely to actually directly visualize the fistula, which is what things like a barium enema cystoscopy lets you do. So, what of these would be the most sensitive modality for air in the bladder? Yeah, CT scan. So that's going to be your best step to start if you think someone has a colovesicular fistula. Yeah. Is, is the next one the barium enema? Uh, I mean, honestly, if it's, I think a barium enema might, might give you some anatomic detail, level of defect, those sorts of things. But in terms of presence or absence of defect, CT scan is what I would hang my hat on. Yeah. Uh, you don't necessarily have to. You're, you're again just looking for air in the bladder. Yeah, yeah. You can, but uh, so I mean, if it was like sigmoid, maybe it would get there. If it's really low or something like that, you might actually be injecting past your injury. But Jess, are you gonna say something? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Vessels. Yeah, but, but yeah. I think, yeah, I think people get really hung up on identifying the anatomy of the fistula. All you need to do is present or absent. That's well, so that's what you, you have to do that. You have to distend the bladder with some form of like contrast or something. You can't, I mean, I guess you could let them have some urine in their bladder and it be full and see some air, that would be fine. But um, really you just can't have like this decompressed bladder. That's gonna be unhelpful. But presence or absence of that fistula is enough to go to the operator. Um, okay, so uh, we'll come back to the front row. I think I kind of skipped over Carson. So a 23-year-old gentleman has a GSW of the abdomen, fast is positive. He goes to the OR. He has a transection of the lower third of the ureter. Uh, what is the most appropriate strategy to repair this ureteral injury? It's lower third, so kind of down in the pelvis. <laughs> Yes, reimplantation right back into the bladder, right? A Foley catheter will do nothing for the injury. You're not going to do a, your uh, primary repair over a stent that low. And for the purposes of the absite, please just never answer D or E. Never answer them. Frankly, in the acute trauma setting, also never do those, please. Because a renal autotransplant is insane. And a transureteral ureterostomy risks your contralateral uninjured ureter at the time of an acute trauma. Um, so just we'll briefly run through some stuff. So for ureteral trauma, if you have a small segment that's missing and it's in the upper third uh, or middle third, what would kind of be the typical description of a repair, Jamie? Isn't that when you do kind of the repair over a stent? Is it? Yes. So your answer is spatulate and primary repair over a stent. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so spatulate, primary repair over a stent. Lower third. Kevin Carson just nailed it. What do you do? Reimplant back into the bladder. Now, so if you have a large segmental defect, greater than two centimeters, you can't perform a primary anastomosis without tension, and it's upper. Um, what uh, what what would you do? Uh, see Connor. So upper middle third, large segment missing. What might you do? No, so that would be maybe later you'd ask for urology to help with ileal interposition, but a, a, a temporizing manner in which they can still drain urine from that kidney and you can come back and find that ureter. I'm sorry? 
Yes, but and you also want to kind of tie off. Sorry, this text is really small, but you want to mark and tie off those ends so they're not leaking intraperitoneally. You can find it later. That's the instance where you you know perk nephrostomy, go find it later. And then if it's a large segment injury, but it's in the lower third, uh, this you might need the uh, psoas hitch or blurry flap. That's the instance where I would answer those. Really, psoas hitch is probably your first move. Sorry. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I would just you tie it off, send it IR. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. Oh, I thought you said in country. I thought you meant here. Um, yeah. Yeah. You you could do that. Yeah, you could do it under IR, either IR guidance or you could place it yourself. Or the one thing you could do is you could place it in the uh, distal aspect of the proximally transected ureter and externalize that as your percutaneous nephrostomy yeah. tube. It would really be a ureterostomy tube and you over the other end. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've never put in double J stents, but uh, you could do that. You could use like a very small feeding tube, those sorts of things. But um, I, okay, so yeah, IV methylene blue can be used to check for leaks. And uh, so, Frank, in what direction does the blood supply to the ureter come from? Uh, like three and nine. Not quite. Uh, it's different. So for the upper two thirds the blood supply arrives from a certain direction. From the lower third, it arrives from a certain direction in terms of areas where you might not want to dissect on the ureter and over-skeletonize. So for the upper two thirds, your blood supply arrives from medial. For the lower third, it, it arrives from lateral. So that affects kind of how you should handle the ureter and, and what you should be thinking about when you're skeletonizing it. Um, in terms of bladder trauma, so hematuria is the best indicator. Most are associated with pelvic fractures. Uh, what is kind of the, the best test to diagnose uh, bladder trauma, Pat? Uh, yeah, or some form of a cysto. Sorry, I should change it. Cystogram sounds like you're direct scoping. That's not the first move. So yes, CT cysto would probably be the first move. Um, and then so Todd, how would you manage an extra peritoneal bladder rupture? Yes, for how long? The patient hates it. They're ready to go home, but they want it out. It's been three days. Okay, how much longer? Uh, yeah, yeah. I would, I would say I would err on the longer side, but yeah, 14 days is generally the recommendation. Um, and then if it's an intraperitoneal uh, injury, uh, Olivia? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. With absorbable suture. Otherwise that can be a nidus for stone formation and then, you know, fully drainage, but that can come out sooner sometimes. Uh, so your urethral trauma, uh, any um, kind of physical exam signs or symptoms, Carson? Uh-huh. What about like on DRE or inspection of their perineum? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, so you have these findings on exam, Jamie, um, we're going to go to the OR. Do you, do you place a Foley? Do you attempt a Foley? Uh, no. Correct. Um, what would be the best test to diagnose a first, I say best first test to diagnose urethral injury, Kevin? It is a rug. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so retrograde urethrogram is the best first test. And what's the typical location of the injury, Connor? Uh, yeah, or that has a name like this portion of the urethra. Uh, or sometimes it'll be called like membranous just as it exits the prostate because that's it's kind of a fixed area. Um, so membranous portion uh, kind of from straddle injuries. And if people have uh, significant tears, you know, they're full, um, fully circumferential, you know, how much you manage that, Frank? Even if you're not going to repair their urethra, you can do this. Yeah, it's just an SP tube. Divert them proximally, let that thing scar in, come back a lot later, like two to three months later, so they don't have issues with strictures and uh, uh, sexual dysfunction. If it's small partial tears, you know, you can, if your urologist wants to get away with bridging a catheter because they scope it in, that's fine. But, you know, if they have a urethral injury, you know, an SP tube is also not the wrong answer. Um, 
let's see, testicular cancer. So seminomas are the number one testicular tumor. Um, what's kind of the typical um, tumor marker elevation for these PAT? No, AFP actually must be uh, negative for them to have a pure seminoma. So what's the other one we think of? Yeah, so, so beta ACG, even though, so it's hard to remember this sometimes. So a lot of seminomas will have elevations of neither. However, 10 to 20% of pure seminomas have beta ACG elevation. None should have an AFP elevation, okay? So if there's an AFP elevation, it's something else. Um, they're extremely sensitive to XRT. All stages, like we talked about, get orchiectomy and retroperitoneal XRT. Um, chemo, you don't need to know some of that. Um, you can resect residual disease, for instance, if there's mediastinal involvement or what have you. So for non-seminomous tumors, there's a number of types, um, but what tumor markers might be elevated for these, Todd? Don't overthink it. You can, you know, you can, and what else? Yeah, so typically both. Some will just have AFP, if, you know, it's choreo or something like that, um, but 90% will have some form of both. Um, and then classically, um, the, uh, Increasing numbers of, you know, kind of various components within a teratoma make it more likely to be malignant. All stages should get an orchiectomy and retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Um, and then this is stuff about chemo. That's that's too much. But the method of orchiectomy, Todd, we talked about this on that earlier question. How are you going to do it? Yes, a radical transinguinal orchiectomy. You're never going transcrotal if you think it's cancer. Um, Okay, a couple of questions on renal cell carcinoma. It's the number one primary tumor of the kidney. We talked about smoking as a risk factor. Um, Olivia, any other signs and symptoms that might be in kind of a classic vignette? Yeah. Yeah, or say it's even in just the left renal vein and it's obstructing a, a, ve a vein that drains into the left renal vein. I'm sorry? Yeah, and how would that manifest? Uh, or yeah, so like an adult male who has a new left-sided varicocele is how that typically is, is written in a vignette. Um, and then you mentioned kind of abdominal pain, a mass, new hematuria is a concerning finding. We'll talk about that for bladder cancer too, but certainly could be a finding in renal cell carcinoma in smokers. Um, you can resect oligometastatic disease, uh, the longest and most common site. Um, they can produce uh, erythropoietin and other... Um, other hormonally active uh, metabolites that can give um, perineoplastic syndromes. Um, the treatment is going to be a radical nephrectomy, and that includes resection of IVC tumor thrombus. That is not a prohibitive uh, point to resection. That, that tumor thrombus typically comes out without an issue, um, and it's something that can be done even if it goes all the way up to the level of the heart. Um, so partial nephrectomies, the people you consider these in are those with either a solitary kidney, those with marginal renal function who would be rendered dialysis dependent, and they have small tumors, basically, is, is the stuff you should remember. So we talked about perineoplastic syndromes. Um, you can have not just um, erythropoietin. Anyone else have any other uh, metabolites that come to mind for RCC? It's basically like every perineoplastic syndrome you can think of. You can shout them out. Mm -hmm. PTHRP is one. Um, we talked about some adrenal stuff earlier. And uh, so you can have a renin and then someone said ACTH. Yeah. So those are, those are the things they can all kind of come with the RCC and then they can secrete insulin. I don't really know why, but it can happen. Um, treatment of a transition. This is not an RCC, but a transitional cell, uh, cancer of the, uh, ureteral pelvis. It's just, you know, even more radical surgery, uh, nephro ureterectomy. Um, and then the tumors associated with VHL, Jamie. Yeah, CNS tumors. Yeah, yes, yes. You you get credit for CNS tumors. So yes, sign language counts. It counts. Um, okay, so bladder cancer. Um, usually a transitional cell carcinoma. Um, the most common symptom, or what should tip you off, maybe in an adult male smoker. Yeah, especially painless hematuria. Um, we talked about smoking pretty extensively. Uh, the manner for diagnosis being a cystoscopy. Um, how might you, you treat this? There's, there's basically a certain level of the bladder through which if it invades, you do more. But um, if it's just T1A and it's just an lamina appropriate or something else you can do. Yeah, or TURBT and do you inject something? 
Yes, you do. Pat is nodding his head. Pat, what is that thing you inject? Yeah, so that's generally the the um, the answer. If it's T1 and the muscle is not involved, you can do uh, transurethral or TURBT, trans transurethral resection of a bladder tumor plus intraventricular BCG. And then if the wall is invaded, they need a cystectomy. Basically, whether you give them a conduit and yield bladder, the abscite is not gonna and should not ask that, but muscle involvement, cystectomy. I just remember that. Um, and then is there any type of infection you should think of if someone has a, a squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder? Yeah, schistosoma hematobium. Yes, yeah, wow, all right. For all the viewers at home, clap it up for Frank. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, you had to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Testicular torsion peaks by age 15. Um, they usually exact, you know, usually torse towards the midline. So as Pat mentioned, you, the typical manner of detorsion is to open a book. Um, and then you do a bilateral transscrotal orchiopexy uh, with or without, you know, um, orchiectomy if there is a clearly non-viable testis. So um, that is it for urology. We'll move quickly into uh, gynecology. Um, so a 45-year-old woman has undergone, um, Maria, since you just joined us, a 45-year-old woman has, has undergone a, a total abdominal hysterectomy for a fibroid uterus. Um, she, um, okay, yeah, so there, it's, it's a difficult case. You decide to try to trace the ureters to avoid injury. Um, where, uh, is the most likely site of a ureteral injury? Yeah, it's it's B. So it's where the it's where the uterine vessels come in, typically kind of down low um, on the uterus, kind of as if you can imagine, kind of like a cone shaped organ, kind of down low. That's where the ureters are going to cross in the pelvis, right? Though ovarian vessels are higher up, it, at that point, the ureter should be much more posterior. So at the time of ligation of the uterine vessels is typically when a ureteral injury would occur. Uh, uh, Kevin, let's see. <laughs> Each of the following should always be part of a complete operation for localized ovarian cancer, except... You may consider, especially if a woman is of childbearing age, you say, see, yeah. So for women of childbearing age, that would be kind of the one instance where you might preserve the contralateral uh, ovary. Otherwise though, we'll get to it. You should in all cases do, you know, directed biopsies, four quadrant washings and biopsies, omentectomy, uh, periodic lymph node dissection. Um, so uh, Carson, a 31 year old woman comes to the emergency department, she's nauseous, dizzy, tachycardic, irregular menses, um, reportedly multiple sexual partners, and notes that her last menses was about six weeks ago. She's hypotensive and tachycardic, diaphoretic, and pale. Her beta HCG is elevated. After fluid resuscitation, uh, what would be the next appropriate management strategy? Uh, let's see. Yes, I believe so. Good. Yes, because you know, you, you know in your head they're trying to get you to whisk this person away to the OR, but this is a classic kind of next step question. You know, you want to type and cross them, get a CBC, check their coax, you know, in here I would add, you know, start resuscitation um, and then figure out, um, you know, some parts of this question are very much leading you towards a ruptured, ruptured ectopic pregnancy. There are, you know, whether someone is tachycardic and hypotensive um, and, you know, kind of the multiple sexual partners is a typical vignette for someone who may have PID as well. Is this a ruptured tubo ovarian abscess and this woman is septic? Uh, those are those are different things. So um, Jamie, during an elective resection of a sigmoid colon, um, there's in a 65-year-old woman, so she's clearly postmenopausal, there's a solid six centimeter right ovarian mass. What would be the most appropriate management? Like intraoperatively for the sigmoid. Just what would you do based on the question in front of you? Because you're not going to be able to get this additional information on the app site. I don't know. I, I don't know. How to, I'm sorry. So they want they want you to to move forward and and do hysterectomy BSO. I guess so. Their their point being I, this may not be the best score question ever, but the point being that a six centimeter solid mass in a postmenopausal woman is never normal. Right. 
right? It's never normal. It's not going to be some corpus luteum cyst. It's not going to be something else that could be hormonally active in a premenopausal woman. It's ovarian cancer. And so the treatment for ovarian cancer is that. Not the greatest question, but that's what they're trying to get at. Is that this, you know, you have to take into account is this woman pre or postmenopausal? That's kind of the crux of the decision making. Um, very briefly, we'll run through vaginal and vulvar cancer, and then the higher yield stuff is ovarian, endometrial, cervical cancer. Um, so the most common type being a squamous cell. Uh, is DES associated with any, any specific type of vaginal cancer? Uh, Frank, with the esoteric step three questions. Is it? It's uh, associated with a clear, yes, clear cell carcinoma of the vagina is DES. It's, it's something, it's not really used anymore. It used to be uh, given in pregnancy, um, maybe back in the 80s. So it's something that, you know, we may be seeing now as women reach later adulthood. Um, and then what is sarcoma botrytis, uh, Connor? But what is the diagnosis? Are you going to tell the parents you're... you're your daughter has little great white. <laughs> no. But what, what does it mean? What is sarcoma botrytis? Pat? Yes. Yeah. A rhabdomyosarcoma of the, of the vagina that typically occurs in young girls. Yeah. Um, risk factors for vulvar cancer, Todd? No. <laughs> Generally, generally, women that are women that are elderly, nulliparous, have not had children. So it 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 goes along with um, uh, it can be confused with uh, sometimes uh, people will get lichen sclerosis. You think of uh, uh, estrogen deprivation, basically. So elderly women who are nulliparous, um, and the treatment if it's if it's early stage would just be a wide local excision. If it's bigger than two centimeters, it's generally uh, more invasive, a radical vulvectomy. But I don't think they'll ask that. Um, for ovarian cancer, if you had to rank, you know, ovarian, endometrial, and cervical, which of those three is the number one cause of gynecologic cancer death? Yes, ovarian is the number one. Uh, what are some uh, protective factors? We'll go back to the front. Maria. Uh, having the uh -huh. uh, Yeah, any, any medications that are protective? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if maybe it's counterintuitive or what, but OCPs and, B, and tubal ligation are actually protective. Um, and then risk factors being, you know, additional sources of um, uh, estrogen exposure, like early monarchy, late menopause, those sorts of things. Um, there are various types. Um, the staging is shown here. That, you know, you're unlikely to be asked the, the various types, but the importance of the staging that's kind of an oddity is that involvement of both ovaries is still stage one basically. Um, and then basically you just start thinking about the spread. So pelvis stage two, abdomen three, distant stage four. Um, and then let's see. So, so the most common site of uh, additional regional spread, uh, Carson, uh, or just a, the contralateral ovary typically, I think. Um, and then the treatment for all stages, same for all stages, Jamie. Okay. Uh, what, what? And what else? And what else? So you got the THBSO, and then what else? Uh, there's a lot more surgery. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you do pelvic and periaortic lymph node dissection, omentectomy, four quadrant washings, directed biopsies. This is, you know, it seems complicated, but you remember this for all stages of ovarian cancer. It makes it very easy. Okay. Um, and then you can give chemotherapy thereafter. Is there a role for tumor debulking, Frank? Uh, yes, there is certainly. Yes, there is a role. It can be effective. It helps you know your chemotherapy and XRT be effective. And then uh, Pat, what is a Krukenberg tumor? Then, uh, not, not a colon cancer. Yeah, gastric cancer most typically. Um, and then uh, Todd, what is Meig syndrome? Okay, anyone? Yes, there's ascites. You also get a hydrothorax, Jess. Were you saying something? You're saying an, an ovarian fibroma. So yeah, you get an ovarian fibroma, ascites, hydrothorax, and excision of this tumor resolves the entire syndrome. Is it only an isolated fibroma or is it like My understanding is it's an isolated thing. I don't think you're you're 
doing like peritoneal stripping and stuff like that. Uh, probably through little fenestrations in the diaphragm, the same way people get like hepato hydrothorax and that kind of thing. But yeah. uh, endometrial cancer. So this um, is the most common uh, malignant tumor uh, for women, but it is not the most common cause of cancer death. Um, and then risk factors for it being null nulliparity, uh, late first pregnancy, uh, basically, you know, instances of unopposed estrogen exposure, especially in the postmenopausal setting. Um, and then, so when you're faced with a vignette that is uh, vaginal bleeding in a postmenopausal patient, what is it until proven otherwise, basically? Okay, yeah, endometrial cancer. The staging and treatment is, is again, it's not terribly difficult as far as what the ab site wants. I would just remember that, you know, for stage one and two, uh, you can either do surgery or XRT, and for stage three and four, you do both. That's, that's really the takeaway. This is from Pfizer. I would not spend a ton of time on this, but if you can remember some of these simple kind of cut points, then um, you'll be fine. And then uh, for cervical cancer, so it's associated with HPV 1618. Um, what's the most common type of cancer? Uh, Connor? I'm sorry? Yeah, squamous cell. Yeah, don't overthink it. Um, and then the most common uh, site of nodal metastases, Frank? No. Not quite. The obturator nodes, I think, are typically the, the most frequent. Um, and then the, the treatment. Uh, so if someone has microscopic disease or, or um, CIN3 or what have you, it's fully treated with a cone. Uh, biopsy uh, for stage one and two. So that which is limited to the cervix and upper vagina is treated with the TAH. Uh, and then if it's stage three or four, so it is, uh, you know, kind of started to invade the pelvis uh, or has, has more distant um, spread to involve adjacent organs, uh, that's when you would consider primary XRT for these patients. Uh, just two more slides. Um, staging is shown there. Um, so again, Maria, um, where are the uterine vessels located? In the broad ligament, yeah. Um, risk for ectopic pregnancy, Carson? Yes, 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 yeah. Prior uh, tubal manipulation of any form. So um, in terms of surgery, PID, a previous ectopic, um, and then the treatment of uh, PID, uh, Jamie? Yeah, any specifically? Like specific about mm -hmm. um, your subtraction. And anything else? Subtraction, like a uh, Sometimes people say subtraction and doxy sometimes. Uh, I mean, I'm sure that there's a, a number of regimens, but that's something that's broad and covers both gonococcal and chlamydial infections. Um, treatment of a tubo ovarian abscess, uh, Kevin? typically IV antibiotics that are more broad. Uh, and then, okay, so the most common cause of gynecologic death, we talked about it, Connor. Yeah, ovarian cancer. Uh, the most common malignant tumor of the female general tract, Frank? Yes, yeah. And then stage one and two, THBSO, three or four, you add the XRT. Right. Uh, any contraindications to estrogen replacement, Pat? Uh, endometri uh, so estrogen replacement would, would improve a woman's uh, bone mineral loss. Yeah, yeah. Smoking, history of endometrial cancer, thromboembolic disease, uh, undiagnosed or uncontrolled uh, vaginal bleeding. Sorry, I don't know what's going on with the AV stuff. Makes it work. Um, and then what are kind of the bad types of HPV? Yes. And then, uh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, 3133. And then what's the most common indication for hysterectomy, Todd? Yeah, fibroids. Fibroids. No, that's, that's, so you said fibroid storm. The diagnosis that comes up occasionally with our fibromyalgia patients is fibro storm, not fibroid storm. Yeah. And then again, our sarcoma botrytis is a vaginal rhabdomyosarcoma in young girls. Um, that's all that I have for urology and gynecology. Feel free to ask questions. Otherwise, we'll, we'll let people 
get back to work. Yep. Thanks, guys.